scripture memory verse tonight, Psalms 91.1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91.1. Did I get it wrong? Under. Oh, under. I got it wrong. I said in the shadow, didn't I? How are you going to be in the shadow? Well, there is no shadow. I, I don't like the word shadow either, so we'll get to that in a minute. Because there's no greater light, so there is no shadow. <laughs> it's really shade. <laughs> He's protecting you from the fire. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. It, it's, it's poetic, so it's okay to use the word shadow. Anybody else want to try it and see if you can do it better than me? Since we're in competition. <laughs> he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Where's it at? Psalms 91 1. Good job. <laughs> we like to say the address first and then say it and then say the address again so we remember it. Because it's, it's really easy to forget the addresses. Sorry for the breach. <laughs> that's fun. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. I, I started years ago, and I tell this all the time. I started years ago, and then all of a sudden I knew verses, but I didn't know where they were at. So I couldn't actually open my Bible and show people those verses when they, when they said, "Really, that's the Word of God." So we want to remember the addresses, and so the, the TMS Topical Memory System that we did years ago, they had them at the top of the card and at the bottom. So. Yeah, I've got a lot of those too that I can burn, and I'm like, what's that? This is where is that? Printing tin. Yeah, where uh, is it? <laughs> but I got, the, you know, I get a big long thingy, and now I can't remember the address. Can't remember where it's at. That's why we yeah. wanted to get the address. Yeah. We don't need the address to share with somebody, but if they say where is it, or you want to go to it yourself, yeah. it's good to know the address. And there's lots of search engines to figure it out, but I like to be able to go there. Anyway, anybody else want to try it? Anybody else? Yeah. 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 All right. Psalm 91.1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Take your time. I can't think of it. <laughs> 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 of the Most High. Of the Most High. Shall abide. Under the shadow of the Almighty. There you go. Say finally. Where was it at, Rita? It was at 90, Psalms 911. 91. Whatever. 911. Good job. Good yeah, job. 911B. Exactly right. Anybody else want to try it? Psalm 911. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. Under the shadow of the Almighty. Good job, Mike. Anybody else want to try? Psalms 91 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91 1. Good job. Anybody else? Thanks for not breaching the protocol, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna try Come it? On, yeah. I can't make that any worse than it. Anybody else? <laughs> this is a funny Bible study tonight, isn't it, Rita? She, Rita looked around and goes, <laughs> it was everybody. I knew it was everybody. It was a joke. Okay, well, let's look. 91 1. 
and following, um, of course, we do not know the author, it's anonymous, uh, but what an amazing psalm. It's a psalm of life, it's a psalm of trust, it's a psalm of, about the Messiah, it's a messianic psalm. Um, when we get over to, for sure, on verse um, 11, you see what Satan tried to quote to Jesus during the temptations. And so they call this a messianic psalm. And I believe, and I, I, I won't be able to bring it out fully, maybe as I mature in the Lord, I will be able to, or as the Lord reveals it. But this is really a picture of life itself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is life. This is a picture of him abiding. This is a picture of him being in Christ, being in the Lord. He's being God himself. And he did all of this for us. Went through everything that we're going to see here. And he has given us um, a place that we can trust. He walked it out for us. And so it says he, and, and, and notice that the first couple of verses are going to be choices that we make. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And um, let me get my notes here together for you. Dwelleth, of course, is the King James. It means to sit and remain and dwell. It means to settle down. Uh, it, it, but here's, here's the, the word I like that it means. It means to marry. It's, it's the word marry. Uh, so, because everything about our relationship with God is being married back into the family of God through the person of Jesus Christ. So he who uh, uh, marries in the secret place of the Most High is an interesting way, or continues. It's a place of dwelling. When we think about it, we think about a house, an abode, a dwelling and stuff. Uh, but it's a place to sit down and be still uh, and, and in the secret place of the Most High. And that, the secret place is a covering. A covering. And that's, what, again, what marriage is about, is a covering. Everything in our life is about a covering. In the Old Testament, the covering was the law. The kofar was a covering so that God did not have to destroy him. And Christ becomes our covering. Adam was a covering to Eve and did not do it properly, and so we all come into sin. And then the law was a covering until, until Christ comes, and then Christ becomes the covering, and that's the place that we want to dwell at. We want to abide in that secret place of Christ, abide in Christ. Uh, so he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, notice he's the Most High. Now you're going you're to have four really good names of God. This is El Yon. Uh, this is El Yon here is most high, the supreme, most high, or the highest, uh, the highest of anything, but it's used as of God here, the most high. The word dwell, let me not pass this up. I want to, I want to, the first usage of the word dwell was in Genesis 4, 16, and it's when Cain went out and he dwelt in the land of Nod. And you know what? There's many Christians that are dwelling in the land of Nod. They're asleep. They're asleep at the will of what they're supposed to be doing. And they're not dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, spending time with the Lord, dwelling in Christ, in the womb of Christ, if you will. Because we were talking about this the other, again, me and Michael last night, that we are in a womb. We are in Christ. And just like a baby that is born from the water, they're in somebody else. They're in their mother. And they're getting all their resources from their mother, right? And they're going to be birthed into a different environment to, to live. But they're being in there to get ready for it. And you and I are in Christ. We're dwelling in the secret place, waiting and being prepared uh, by the Most High to be birthed into life, into the heavenly places. That's what we're here for, is to be prepared for that. And we're supposed to be witnesses of that. So what an amazing thought. And then I was talking about it last night, how... Uh, I was talking about it with Wiley and how uh, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And, 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 and so the father is not Adam, the first Adam. So the sin nature is passed from the father to the child. But then the blood is, he said, well, did you know that the blood is not Mary's either? Because there's a membrane that protects and the baby does not get any of its blood from the mom. The baby forms its own blood through its bone marrow that's in its body already where God creates it. And so the blood of baby Jesus and everything about it was from the Most High. And so that's amazing when you start thinking about it that we have our own blood that's formed from our own bone marrow that God creates in us. 
And so I did, I'm blown away by those facts. And then that we're being birthed into a place where we're going to go to heaven because of the blood of Jesus. You know, and, and that's where that blood comes from uh, that we've been born again in. And so we're hiding in the secret place. Well, or of course we say, uh, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. That doesn't mean that we're all abiding there, because that would be my next question. Where are you dwelling at? What is your dwelling place? Where are you dwelling at? Uh, again, dwelling means to sit and remain, and to settle, and to marry, and continue in that place. Um, now, some people come for help. We call it foxhole Christianity. When things get bad, they'll run back to Jesus but they don't spend their time dwelling in the secret place with Jesus, with God Almighty. What they do is they only when it seems like, oh, this is getting overwhelming, and then we run back. But it's not the place that we're living. And it's so important that we live there. It's so important that we learn to stay there. Now, I don't think anybody can do it perfectly except for Jesus. It's, it's a place that we aspire to stay at. We want to stay in that secret place. We want to be close to Him. We want to continue to walk in the Spirit. We want to be led by the Spirit and not be led by the flesh and not go, and, and, you know, and, it's, and it's really hard to do. And it's something that He's working out and working through us as we surrender. The only thing we can do is surrender. Die to self daily and allow the Holy Spirit to keep us in that place, in that secret place where we can hear that still small voice and continue to walk with him daily. And it, but whoever dwells there, and that's, that's what our heart wants to be, because we've got a position there. Listen, you've got a position there, but you have to show up. You've got a position there because of Christ. You've got a place. It's all reserved for you. It's not, it's not his will that any would perish, but all would come to repentance, and we can dwell in that secret place of the Most High, learn to trust him, Learn to be with God every day, walking with Him, practicing His presence, and allowing His wisdom to make our decisions through. Learn to be children of faith, uh, not childish, children of faith, not childish. A lot of times people are childish, but they're not becoming childlike in their faith. Uh, he who does this, of course, it's a choice, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And again, we have this. Um, abide means to stay permanently to continue to endure to remain and I did miss the under didn't I under the shadow um, is the same word together but it's really shade I think it's shade that's just my opinion poetically they're using shadow but remember in order for a shadow to be cast there has to be a light that's greater and so there's no light greater than God. So there's no shadow or shifting in God. And that's what James tells us. And so there's no way, but, but we can see our shadow when that light is upon us. We can see the shadow of what we're doing. But really, I just think if you're remembering that he was a cloud by day and a fire by night in the wilderness, and you remember that they, they were following him and then they rebelled, but, but, but that cloud covered them and protected them. Again, we come back to the covering. And then the fire kept them warm and preserved them through the night and gave them light. And again, the word in the New Testament, when, you see, when we sing in the light of the world, it, it, it's the same word for fire. That fire is that light. That consuming fire is our light that we look to. And this is a, a psalm that we're looking at, a psalm of life, a psalm of light, a psalm of trust, a psalm of hope. It's a psalm that is there to protect us and help us understand and know where we're at. So if we dwell, we choose to dwell, um, marry, be covered by, uh, that protection is there for us. Uh, in the secret place of the Most High. Rain's getting a little heavy, isn't it? What does the King James say under the shadow? They use shadow? They yep, they use shadow too. Yep, yep it does. Every, everybody does because it's a poetry, a book of poetry. Uh, and so, it, but it, but the word can mean shade. The word can mean actually, it can mean shade. It can mean defense. Uh, it can be, be uh, yeah, yeah. No greater light. It, it, that's that's the only that's the only thing I know when I think about God. He's the greatest light, so he can't really be a shadow. Uh, he can cause a shadow to protect you with a cloud, 
And that's, that's what we would look at, is him causing something to be there of the Almighty. And Almighty, again, is another one of the words we want to look at, uh, and it's El Shaddai. This is where the Almighty comes in. Satan is mighty, uh, but God is almighty. He's El Shaddai, the most powerful. The epithet of Jehovah is the most powerful God there is. And then verse 2, again, I will say. Listen, this is, this is the choice of the heart. This is the choice. We have no power uh, except for the Holy Spirit that can cause this to happen, where we dwell at, where we abide at, how we're protected, whose child we are, who we marry. But we can choose because we're free will agents to choose. So notice this, that the psalmist says, I will choose, I will say, of the Lord, um, Elohim. No, excuse me, that's not, I don't even have that down. Are you serious? I was writing these names on purpose, and I didn't get the Lord down. Anybody want to look at it? Can you look it up and see what it is, Michael? I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Notice the choice there. Now, now listen, you can say that, but you have to surrender to allow the Holy Spirit to do that. In order to even dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to keep us there. It's his keeping grace. It's his protection. Is it Jehovah? Okay, so it's Jehovah. Jehovah is the Lord there. Um, he is my refuge, my fortress. And some of these words are really close to each other, and, and, and that's what happens with poetry, repeating or repetitive. Uh, refuge is a shelter. Or, listen, it can be your hope. It can be your trust. It's the person to whom one flees to. Where do you flee to? Is he, is he your husbandman? Are you being covered by him? Are you trusting him? Growing in this relationship is so important. None of us are going to, but positionally we're perfect, but practically we're learning to grow in this relationship and know who to trust, know where to turn. Me and Michael was talking about it yesterday where uh, he stumbled up the stairs or something. Didn't you say he stumbled? And he's like, thank you, Lord. And, and, and when you, just, you know that you're in his presence. And when you're talking, instead of cussing and muttering, we're talking to God. And, and I'm always saying, thank you, Lord. Well, how did that happen, Lord? I just talk to him like he's right there. And, and people probably think I'm crazy, but I really don't care. I mean, I really don't care. He knows. I mean, and I'm going to talk to him all the time because he is right here, right now, with us. And it's okay to sing to him, to talk to him. And, and, and he is answering back because he uses our intellect. But we want to trust him for all things and learn to walk with him. So he's our refuge. He's the one that we flee to. Uh, and then he's our fortress. And, and really, the fortress means a net. It's a net that catches us. Right? It's a strong place. It's a defense. It's a stronghold or a mountain castle. But I like that it, it, it actually is a net. And so he's keeping us. Like we say, you're doing something with no net. No, God's got us. There's nowhere to fall. He's got us with a net to catch us. So he is our fortress. Uh, and then he says, my God, in him I will trust. And my God is Elohim. If you remember in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And so we know who the creator is now. It's Elohim. Uh, and, and, and of course, El is single God. El-O is, 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 is dual God. And then Elohim is the plural word for the supreme God. And he's really using all of these words. But we're going to come back to the Most High. We're going to come back to where we dwell at here later in the psalm. So my God, in him will I trust. One of my favorite words, batak, it's the word for faith in the Old Testament, trust. It's, it's related to it anyway. And it means to hide for refuge, to be confident in or sure. It's to hope in. Uh, and so it's someone that we set our hope and our trust and our confidence in in everything. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is where it's used at, where it says trust, that's batak. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge God and he will make your path straight. And this is what we're talking about here is life. Life is a path that, 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 that plows a straight row. It's not, it's not a crooked row. We're walking according to God and it's a perfect straight highway. And so when we trust him with all of our heart, 
or we trust him and we're saying that we're choosing I'm going to trust him it doesn't matter what he tells me to do what he says to do I want to listen and I want to learn to obey as soon as possible see if you wait to obey a lot of times you don't obey a lot of times you go yeah it's all right well God said to do that but I'm just going to keep moving and we learn to be lackadaisical or complacent in our walk with God but when God speaks that's when you want to react make sure it's him Pray, ask for counsel, make sure it's God, but listen to him. Learn that still, small voice. Be covered in, by him and be married to him and so that we can remain in that secret place and we don't have to always come out from underneath his, his covering or the shadow of his wings. Verse 3. Looking at the wrong place, hang on. Verse 3. Surely... He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Surely he shall deliver you. I'm trying to remember my notes without looking. Uh, so when you choose to trust in him, uh, surely he shall deliver. Uh, this again is to snatch away to defend, to rescue, uh, to take out or to draw out. Uh, so he's delivering us from the snare of the fowler. Now, you, a snare is a snare is um, a net, again, but it's a bird trap. And, and birds are always used as an evil influence uh, in, in the Bible, except for the dove. They, they represent, and, and, when, and when you look at them, so there's a bird trap. There's a snare that's being set. And the fowler is the trapper. This is Satan. He's the accuser of the brother. He's the one that sets the bait stick. He's the one that traps us and tempts us to do these things. And God is the one that delivers us. If we will just abide and continue and remain uh, in the secret place with the Most High, then he's the one that's going to deliver us, rescue us, save is the word too, a uh, really easy word that we know. He takes us out. He draws us out from the snare of the fowler, uh, which is the entanglements that the, that the enemy uses upon us. Um, the vices and the lures of the wicked one to entice us. And so he saves us from that. And the perilous pestilence. Doesn't that sound poetic? perilous pestilence. King James is noisome. My wife used to love that word. She would laugh her butt off at that word. Noisome. Influsia. Huh? Isn't that a fart? Can you say that in Bible study? She used to say it all the time. She would laugh her butt off at it. Yeah. Read your protocol right there. <laughs> oh, it was funny. No, when I see the word noisome, I always think of my wife. So, um, and, but really, um, it, it can mean desire or the ruin. It, it, it's the it, it's it's the very wickedness, perilous. Uh, it's a perverse thing. And then, of course, pestilence is like a plague or destruction. So this can be the desire of, for destruction. He delivers you from the desire for destruction. Listen, we have a desire for destruction. Our sin nature will destroy us. And we have a desire of that. And God, will he will deliver us from that. It doesn't have to take the enemy to trip us. We already have enough problems of our own, enough schemes of our own, enough things of our own that we've made up because of our sin nature and that we don't want to come away from. And so uh, the, the, the fowler doesn't have to trap too hard. We'll walk right into stuff. And so there's that, 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 that plague or that perilous pestilence um, that he delivers us from. And then he says in four, he shall cover, we're back to covering again, you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. Now I had to look this stuff up. So his feathers here, covering again is a hedge. It's a fence in. It's to weave together to make a hedge. So he's defending you. He's covering you. But the feathers is, is a, the flight feathers. It evidently, it's the top of the wing, right? It's the top of the wing that's actually there 
uh, where uh, it's what they fly with. I have no idea. I'm not a bird dude. <laughs> but that's what it says. Because I was kind of confused that it said feathers and then it said wings because I'm thinking the same thing. But I guess on the tail and on, uh, uh, on the top of the wing, there's what's called flight feathers that helps them do their, their flying. And that's what he's talking about there when he says feathers. And he, and he covers us. He hedges us in. He fences us in and covers us with that. And then it says with his wings uh, and under his wings, you shall take refuge. And so it's pretty interesting that as he covers you, we take refuge underneath the shadow of his wings. Uh, and and uh, this is, uh, the wings is, um, like if you have an army, you have the, the right wing and you have the left wing, and you know, you can say that, or it's the wings of, the, of this bird that, he's, that, that, that is being used poetically uh, as God. Uh, so it's the edge or extremity. Um, and again, we run underneath. That's a choice. See, he's, he's, he's offering his feathers, and then in trouble, we pull underneath, under his wings, and we take refuge underneath his help, underneath the help that he has given us. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing? John 14, 6, once again. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And but this word here for truth can be this, be um, uh, translated his his trustworthiness, his faithfulness, his firmness, his stability, his certainty. I like that a lot. Peace and stability, integrity of mind. This is what we're looking at: is the character of God. Uh, his truth is, and it shall be your shield and your buckler. Now. I don't know nothing about sword fighting either or, or, or uh, shields really, but it's interesting that that um, that shield can mean a thorn. And, and I was like, what? So, so a lot of times these words, you know, especially Hebrew is you can change them up. They're, they're used in a lot of different ways and it actually means a thorn or it can mean a shield or a buckler. It's used 10 times as a buckler, and a buckler is a great big shield that you can hide behind. And it's like the four-foot shield that we talk about up in um, um, Ephesians 6, uh, the shield of faith that uh, we use to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And it's interesting, he's getting ready to talk about some arrows flying. So the shield and the buckler, and, and it, so it's a, it's a defense uh, the, his truth is a defense and a tower because the buckler here is only it's the only time it's used and it's something that surrounds the whole person this is and so when it uses a buckler here it's not talking necessarily of a shield but a complete they're, they're completely covered front and your rear guard he's completely covering with this shield and buckler the truth is exactly what we always want to learn it's his word he is the truth and we want to make sure that we're learning truth, spending time in truth, dwelling in the secret place, the this, this secret place with Christ, learning truth, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us. And then he's going to mention some things. He's not going to mention them by, by actual, because all of us go through different things it takes to shape our character. But notice... He says in verse 5, um, You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, verse 6, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of destruction that, that lays waste at noonday. So he gave us uh, all, uh, I mean, all times of the day, night, day, darkness, noonday, and really noonday, nobody really fought during noonday, and it was too hot. Um, so it was rare for an attack. So that's really speaking of a sudden attack. Just a sudden attack out of nowhere. You think things are going good, and all of a sudden, boom, you got this attack out of nowhere. And, and it's that sudden attack when it's not a time when somebody would attack uh, if you're talking about war. So he says, if you're, if you're abiding, if you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, uh, you don't, and abiding in His truth, you do not need to be afraid 
of terror by night. There's no, re to, no reason to fear or to tremble uh, of a sudden alarm uh, by night, uh, a night season, or the arrow that flies by day. Again, we remember, and it's, it's funny, the arrow is a piercer. I, I know I looked these words up and I go, what in the world? It's a piercer. And so that arrow pierces you, pierces into your truth, pierces into whatever you're doing. Maybe it pierces into your secret place and it draws you out to fight in the physical flesh. But it's an arrow that draws you out. It flies by day. Uh, and so we, we think of Ephesians 6 where the enemy and his fiery darts that he cast at us. Um, or pestilence that walks in darkness. Again, we have the word pestilence. This is a different word. It means a plague or destruction, but it's a different word than the previous one. Uh, it comes, it follows you, uh, and it's obscurity or gloom or at, at dark. And so these are times of attack. These are different places of attack. These are the suddenness of attack. But he's not mentioned any specific thing. Whatever it is in your life that's going on, whatever it is that, that is being allowed to attack in your life, listen, we're going to see in a minute that those attacks are not from the enemy. This is God allowing those to come. This is God allowing those to shape your character. And that's why it's so important not to make the other person, the other people, the other thing, the other party, the, 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 the thing that happened, the enemy, you remember that this is work on your character. This is work where you're supposed to be learning how to control your tongue, learning how to go through the battle, learning how to run the race with these things going on. It rains and shines on the just and the unjust, but God is training his children. He's renewing our mind. He's teaching us how to, to remain in the secret place and to stay covered by him and be good witnesses of him in everything that we do because he's capable he's the one that's almighty he's the one that's the most high he's the one that allows with his sovereignty these things to happen so that we will learn and grow and, and continue to know that this is the safe place that we want to stay is in the life with him in his light that he's covered us he's got us and the enemy cannot harm us so the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Again, that's a sudden, a sudden attack, that destruction that comes, uh, cut, cutting off or ruin. It's a storm causing destruction that happens all of a sudden at, the, at just the wrong time. And we've all had those sudden things. I'm doing good, everything's going great, and then all of a sudden, you're like, what in the world? And that's, that's the one that can really get you, where you can really flip out, where you can really go into the flesh when they're sudden. And we don't want to revile for reviling. There's so many things that come to mind about this, is that when it's just a sudden attack, and we want to learn that, that we are who we are because of Christ. And we are who we are because we're dwelling in the secret place. We are who we are because we're growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the outside stimulus should not cause us to react to it, but we should react according to what the Holy Spirit is doing. We should learn to do that. And it's going to take a lifetime. This is a, a psalm about life, and it's going to take our whole lifetime. We're being trained. But the great news is, is that he is training us. He is teaching us. He is leading us. And we are growing. But it's when we're not abiding, we're saying, oh, you know what, I've been abiding for the rest of it, but I'm not abiding for that. I'm not going for that. I'm just going to get in the flesh right now and do it all in the flesh. And see, that's not dwelling. That's not dwelling in a secret place. So we've given our life to Christ, and he's bought us with the precious blood. And all of these stains are going on purposefully in order to train us and to teach us and to, and, and to uh, help us to understand our gifting and our talents, our abilities, and how to be a witness for Christ because everybody can live in the flesh. But God's children need to learn to be conformed into his image, not conformed into the image of this world. We're being transformed by the renewing of our minds so we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And there's, there's, there's enemies out there trying to trap us. There, there's things that's going to happen, but listen, God knows it's happening and he allows it. And he prepares us for it. And he's telling us that we can trust him no matter what. Look at 7. 
Six was uh, our, you know, our decision. Seven, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. And that's strange because we know that that's not emphatic, but it is if God wanted it to be. He can decide whether 10,000 die or one dies. He can decide whether one dies or 10,000 dies. He can decide all of that. And what he said is you can trust him. It's not going to come as a surprise. It's not really there as a surprise to him. He knows everything that's going to happen. This is not a promise that you'll never get sick. This is not a promise you'll never fall. This is not a promise you'll never get touched. But God could do that at any time he wants. We can li- we're going to live forever in a spiritual realm. We're living forever as spirits, right? But now he's training us. And so it's important that we understand. I think this is uh, uh, poetic in writing to understand that we can trust God, that he knows when one falls, he knows when 10,000 fall, and he can keep it from harming you. Now, there's times when people say, oh, well, I don't have to do that because I'm just going to trust the Lord. Be careful with that. God might give you wisdom to do that instead of, I mean, because it's just what he does, you know. You have to trust God's wisdom in things, and if he's telling you to go do something, you should do that instead of rebelling against what his spirit is telling you to do. Uh, it shall not come near you or nigh you. It's not a guarantee. Okay? It's not a guarantee because if God wants it to come near you, it's coming near you. If God knows you need to be sick or you need to go through the thing, it's coming. But it's saying that God has the power, the authority. He's, he's, you can trust him that it's not coming unless you need it. It's not coming unless it's something that it needs for your character. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, the death of the wicked. Wages of sin is death. Our reward is what going to be what? Our faith will become sight. Our faith in him will become sight. Our trust in him will become sight. And, and literally, you can just, you know, sometimes when you're, when you're just grooving with the Lord, you can see what he's doing. You can see what he's doing in people's lives. You can understand what he's doing because you know where he's going. And, and, and you can pray according to his desire and have, your, and, and have your prayers answered because of that. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. But one day we're going to see him face to face. I love that future hope that we have. Because, why? Now we're going to go back to verse 1, right? We're going to return to that thought. But what's the reason? It's not because of anything that we have done other than making the choice to choose uh, his secret place, to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, to choose to abide uh, uh, under the shadow of the Almighty. He is my fortress and my refuge. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Have you made him your dwelling place? Again, this is why these other things can happen. This is how we can trust him. This is how we can be protected from the snare and delivered from the snare of the fowler because you have made the Lord your refuge. Same word again for Most High. Even the Most High, your dwelling place. Um, Elion, again. But it's a different word for dwelling place. It's the habitation. Thy habitation is what um, the King James says. It's a retreat, an abode of God. And when, when this word is used for God, it's talking about the tabernacle and the temple. And so uh, it, it's the place where we're dwelling with the Most High. And it says, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling." Because we're dwelling with God, right? We're dwelling in the secret place. Um, Listen, it doesn't say that there is no evil. Because there's plenty of evil. But everything that God is allowing, once again, let's look at Proverbs chapter 1. One of my favorite chapters to look at. It doesn't say there is no evil, but it says no evil shall befall you. God is, God is there protecting us. We're in the secret place, and the evil one cannot get to us. He defeated the works of the devil. 
He's defeated all of it. Uh, let's start in verse 20. We really want to get to verse 33, but verse 20. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. How long will you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scoffers delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. We want to repent. We want, we want to change our minds. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. Listen, when you turn, he pours out his spirit. Many people say, well, how do I get the spirit? Well, you need to repent. You need to turn. Uh, in the New Testament, it's metanoia. It's to change your mind, to think differently after you hear the wisdom of God. He's crying out. He's wanting everybody to come to repentance uh, and, and to come and hide in the secret place, to dwell with him. Uh, but look what he says. Uh, Surely I will pour out my spirit. I will make my words known to you. Great verse. We memorized that one once, didn't we? Because I have called and you refuse. Notice it's a choice. Once again, it's a choice. God is calling. God loves us. What do we do? We just did Jeremiah 33, 3 a while ago. God's phone number. She's not even listening to me. Yes. Wasn't it? What, 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 did, it, what did it say earlier? Oh, my goodness. Call unto me, and, and, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. And it's supposed to be God's phone number. Call unto me. And, and, and he's calling us. Uh, but we refuse. Because I have called you and you refuse. Many people refuse. They don't hear the wisdom of God. They're not listening for God. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel. Listen, it's not enough to say a prayer. We want to hear the counsel of God. He's the wonderful counselor. He sends us the Holy Spirit, which is a counselor and a teacher to us. And would have none of my rebuke, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind. Remember that? If you, uh, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Um, God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, you also reap. And if you sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you. Listen, this is, this is, this is why it can't be, uh, he's my dwelling place when there's trouble. And I run to him. It has to be all the time where you're already there. I used to tell this uh I don't know how long it's been since I told this tale, but there's a street fight where a buddy of mine, because uh, <laughs> I use the same ones all the time, a buddy of mine was getting ready to get hit with a baseball bat, and instead of pulling him away from the baseball bat, he was pushed into the baseball bat. Because the closer you are to that impact, the less it's going to hurt. When a baseball hitter hits a home run, it's when they stretch out. And so he could have been killed if somebody would have just been dumb enough to pull him away, but they pushed him into it. And it's the same thing. The closer you are to God, already there in the secret place, already dwelling there, already learning, already listening, already saying, okay, Lord, now what next? Oh, look what happened. I, now I'm not going to freak out because I know God's allowing this. And we already understand. The closer you are, the less the impact. But if you're way away from God, you may never be able to run back. You may listen to the devil and blame God. So we want to stay close in that secret place, abiding there, dwelling there. And so that we are covered already when, when the, we already understand that God knew it was coming. God already prepared us for it coming. He's already training us and preparing us. Uh, um, our struggles today will be our strengths for tomorrow. The only proverb God ever gave me right before I got out of prison. Our struggles today will be our strengths for tomorrow. What you're going through right now and God allows it. It's like a sore there. You want to pay attention to it. And you want to bandage it. And so as you struggle, now you want to cry out to God. And he's training you so it becomes a strength for tomorrow. Because you learn what God said about it. And you're abiding in it. You're dwelling in it. And you're living through it. And he walks you right through it. And your faith grows because you see that he's done it. That he brought you through that struggle. That he trained you in it. And he taught you how to deal with it in a godly way with wisdom. 28 we're in uh, Proverbs 1 then they will call on me so notice when the whirlwind comes and distress and anguish then they will call on me but I will not answer 
They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And uh, they didn't choose the fear of the Lord, which is obedience, I believe. Uh, they, they would have none of my counsel. Think about that. When we don't listen to what God says. And despise my every rebuke. See, he rebukes us. He reproves us. And he's trying to get us to listen to him. So we'll turn. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way, reap what they sow, and be filled to the full with their own fancies. Yeah. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, death, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Now listen, verse 33 is the only reason I brought you here, but I wanted to lead you up to it. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Once again, no evil is going to touch you. We're in the secret place. We're covered by the Lord. We're under the blood. We're protected. It does not mean that there's not evil. It does not mean that evil won't happen. But God will use it all for good for those who love him and are the called according to his purposes. It may hurt. It may be painful. You might get sick. Someone might die. All those things are going to go on, but God is using it in a perfect way. He's using it in a perfect way to shape the character of the man and the woman of God and the body of Christ together as we learn it together. We see what God is doing. And he says here back in our text that no evil shall befall you because now it becomes the scalpel of God. He allows the enemy to tempt. He allows the enemy to do things. He allows evil to happen, but it's the scalpel of God to shape the man and the woman of God. It's no longer evil because it belongs to God. And the enemy can't get you anymore. Now you can reap some things. You can cause some things. You can step out underneath that secret place away from dwelling at the most high. And if you're not there, you can run into some pretty crazy stuff. But he says, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Because no longer are you accessible by the evil. No longer are you accessible. You're in Christ. You're in the secret place. That's what the because is about. We're there. We've taken our refuge in him. We believe in the Messiah, uh, the Mashiach of God. And then, of course, he says, for he shall give. And this is, uh, uh, we, this is um, the verse from Matthew 4, 6 and Luke 4, 9. Why will it? Why will it not befall you? Why will the plague not come to your dwelling? For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And there's a lot going on there. And this is the verse that Satan actually quotes to Jesus, right? But what does he do? He leaves out the second part, 11b, to keep you in all your ways. Now, I, I'm not sure if he leaves it out just because the devil can't quote truth. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe he can't say truth. Maybe he's not. I mean, it just his character, he's not allowed to tear the truth, so he has to leave part of the verse out, you know. And, and, but he can quote it out of context. And he, remember, if you remember, he said to, to Jesus, uh, come on and go up to the pinnacle, which is, I think it's like 450 feet feet high and go to the pinnacle and throw yourself down and he quotes this verse for it is written uh, that for he shall give his angels charge over you in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone so he left out 11b uh, and, and again he's trying to convince uh, uh, Jesus to take a shortcut to holiness to take a shortcut and, and if he was to throw himself off Guess how famous he would have been? Because the angels would have caught him before he hit. If he would have threw himself off that pinnacle, the angels would not. The verse is true. It's perfectly true. They would not have let him uh, hit the ground. Stub his toe is what that means. But dash your foot against a stone. Um, interesting. But it, 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 to keep you in all your ways is like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Look to Him. Ask Him for wisdom and He will make your path straight. 
And that's what we want. And that's what the enemy was trying to leave out. He wanted Jesus to do it his way. And he wants to leave it out with you and me. He wants us to do it our way. Well, I got a new plan. See, the church has got a new plan. It's not the church of God, but there's churches out there that's got a lot of new plans. They're making up a lot of, a lot of new doctrine. A lot of new things that God didn't say, and they want you to follow it. And, they, and it feels good. It looks good. It keeps the peace in the building. It makes everybody feel good about themselves. But it's, but it's simply not God's way. And the enemy wants us to make all these shortcuts in our life. That's why, that's why a lot of times I speak against books, reading books. These are shortcuts. Shortcuts to going through the struggle. Shortcuts to going through the battle. Shortcuts to building the character. Shortcuts to reading the Bible and spending time with God and finding out what he's saying to you, not what he said to somebody else. It doesn't mean that every book is bad. It doesn't mean that books get, but they can get you chasing a rabbit trail that's not even God because it was a good idea that they wrote down. And you can get chasing something that's not even a word for you. And you, you can be believing it and following it. And it may not be an untruth, but it may not be what God really wants to say to you. So you want to know what God really wants to say to you and protect you, but the enemy wants to get you off course. He wants you, he wants you to go another way and to try to get there some other way except for the except for the way that God has planned for your life to train you and to teach you. So he'll point and command and give give angels or messengers, ambassadors charge over you. And so so even that word there again is it can be a prophet, it can be a priest, it can be a teacher. Uh, that word for angel. And if you look at Hebrews, Michael just taught this, I think Hebrews. Um, what is it, 114? Do I have a note on that somewhere? Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, I think. Let's just look there real quick. It's interesting the way it's written in this. Um, verse 113, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Set at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit his, his salvation? Now listen, it's really interesting because that word for spirit there is the word pneuma. It's the same word for spirit all the time. But the context is angels. That's why I read 13 also. Or you would think, are they not all just ministering spirits instead of angels? But he's talking in reference to the angels that he mentioned in verse 13. And so... Um, angels are sent on assignment I, I don't know uh, personally anywhere in the Bible that it says that each one of us have one single angel watching over us I don't know anywhere where it says that but a lot of people will try to put that forth but angels are they, they minister before the Lord you know there's seraphim there's cherubim there's different angels there's there's Michael and Gabriel there's the war angel the messenger angel there's different rankings of things going on but there's angels that are here on assignment and, and, of course, for Christ for sure because we know that was used in that text and somehow the devil knew it too and he was trying to use it against uh, Jesus like he wasn't God in the flesh, you know what I mean? And so he tried to use it against him and misquoted it to get him to follow him. And, and the enemy can do that. Can take, think about this for a minute. It's what he did with Eve. He, he just added one little word to what was said to Eve and then Eve he listened to him. And then Adam had to listen to Eve because he didn't want to lose his wife. Be very careful uh, and listen to what God is saying because you can get just a little bit of it wrong and all of a sudden you've got a new gospel. And it's not something you're going, ah! And no, you're secure. You're secure. If you, if you dwell in the secret place, you're going to be okay. He'll, you will abide. Then he covers you with his wing. He's taking care of you. He's leading you. He's not going to let you go very long and doing something wrong without spanking your butt, without correcting you, without teaching you, without showing you that it's falsehood if you're his kid. Because God, one thing God is, is a good father. And he knows how to take care of his children. He knows how to parent us. And he knows exactly what we need. He knows when to apply it, when to cause it to happen, when to allow it to happen because we did something. He knows exactly what he's doing in such a perfect timing that it just blows your brain when you look back on it and you see the, 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 the trail where God had been always there with you, always pursuing you, always talking to you, always protecting you. 
I do think we'll get to heaven and our guardian angel uh, or, or angels or those that protected us and go, so you're a tyrant, huh? We've been waiting for you. Rushing in where we were afraid to go. No, I'm teasing. But sometimes, I mean, they're protecting us. We talked about the other night at prayer. You know how many, we talk about what's going on. What's going on in your life? Like, this is painful. This hurts. This is crazy. Why is this still going on? Think about all that you've been saved from. That you didn't have to go through because of guardian angel. Because God. Because you are not going through it. Look at what some other people are going through. But God did not see that you're supposed to go through that. Each one of us have a love relationship. Each one of us are, are, are covered and betrothed to Christ. And he knows exactly what we need to learn to do. He knows our bench. And he knows what we are stubborn about. And what we don't want to do. And where our idols and everything are at. He knows about our rebellion and our witchcraft. And that we're not willing to do things. And so he brings them in slowly. So that he trains us and he leads us and he treats us like children and, and, and he protects us as a bride and he does this amazing work to get us to follow him and to desire to follow him. And if we remain in sin, you know what he does? He'll give you a bucket full of it to where you're sick of it and you want to follow him now. And you're saying, Lord, take this from me. This is crazy. Why did I ever start that? Why did I ever do that? And, he, and, and he's just so tender with us and long-suffering. And, uh, and he protects us. And uh, he won't let us even stub our toes. He's protecting us. That's what it lets you dash your foot against a stone. Stub your toe. Isn't that funny? Where are 50 feet? I don't even want to stub it. <laughs> yeah, it would be. <laughs> He's stubbing. It would be. A, it would be a crushing, huh? But that's why he already knew the angels would protect him. And so that all of a sudden he'd be the famous one that, got, that jumped and stopped. You know, like the Bugs Bunny cartoons when he would crash the plane and it would stop right as he ran out of gas? It just stopped. That's the way it would have been when the angels protected him. Yeah, you're right. Uh, unless, unless you dash your foot. He's talking about that there would be nothing happened to him at all. Um, dash a stone, stub a toe. And that's either a small stone or it could even be a foundation stone which um, Jesus is both. Bear you up, lift you up. I like, I like that word where he says, uh, to keep you in all your ways that their hands, they shall bear you up. Their power is what their hands represents figuratively. Bear you up is the same word used in Genesis 7:17 7, uh, when it says the waters uh, lifted, lifted the ark up. After it was raining for four, it lifted them up. It bared them up. The water did. And that's what the Spirit does for us is it lifts us up and it bears us up and it keeps us from... It, in other words, nothing's going to happen in your life. Not even stub your toe unless God knows about it. I mean, it's just not happening. It's not outside of the control of God. You didn't fall off of God's desk and you're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on? God doesn't know. He knows exactly what's going on. He, he, he's, he's, he's using it to train you. He didn't cause it. It's like he didn't cause original sin. He just put the, he allowed the, the serpent to be in the garden. But he didn't cause Eve to follow him because they already had the, as much truth as they needed to not follow him. But then again, he knew exactly what they were going to do. And he knows exactly what you and I are going to do. So the angels have charge. Um, and I don't know if you, a lot of times when I pray, I ask God to send angels, you know, because angels have charge. And especially when people don't know Jesus, I tell, send angels, you know, you have charge over them, protect them. And uh, uh, the Holy Spirit's there, but they're obviously rejecting the Holy Spirit. So we need other help to help us. Verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. Uh, very interesting poetic words. Tread upon, walk, or march, or trample over uh, with a downward uh, prospect. But look, notice it's a lion and a cobra. And it really, in the King James, it's an asp or an adder, a uh, venomous serpent, a viper. But the lion, think about that for a minute. Uh, the enemy comes like a roaring lion, and then he's a serpent. And so it's talking about he, he's crushed. And that's why it's a messianic psalm. This is all talking about what Christ has already done, who Christ already is. And then when we're in Christ, 
This is how he's, he's actually protecting us and how we can actually draw near. And it's an automatic thing that happens if we, would just, if we will just dwell in the secret place of the Most High and keep running to him and keep trusting in him and learn to obey and trust him uh, and to call upon his name. He knows where we're at. He knows what's going on. Uh, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Um, which reminds me that Jesus crushed Satan's head um, and he bruised his foot. And so you get it again, you get the stub in the toe. Um, but, but it's actually the young lion and then it says the dragon um, instead of a serpent. Um, it's the dragon this time is what, it, is what the word really is. And it can be a sea serpent. I, I think of Leviathan, but I don't know. That's used in, in Job. And in the Psalms, it's a, it's a, it's either a marine, uh, a mariner, or a land monster. It can be a crocodile. I think it was a crocodile during the ten plagues. That word was translated crocodile. Uh, but you're going to again stomp upon them. It's a different trample is a different word here than tread upon them. It's stomp upon them, uh, trample them under your feet. Um, and here's a, here's the interesting thing that it said about trample. It said. To trample underfoot as a potter does clay. I like that. I don't know what that means. I mean, I liked it. But I, I'm assuming that a potter getting his clay to be ready to be used, and he's walking on it to soften it and to soften it and to work on it to get it ready and be pliable. I don't I don't know why uh, he would. But he was saying we would do that to completely crush um, the, the, the young lion and the dragon underfoot and again we're going to have a because we got a couple more becauses I like becauses because they tell you that's why they're, they're leading you to well, what's, the, why, what's the cause of that because he has set his love upon me therefore I will deliver him and you see there, there's a change uh, where God is now speaking completely I think the way that's written uh, because we have set our love upon him then, then he's going to deliver us. And so, um, where's that at? It means to cling to and to join to. To join together or to cleave to. We're back to the marriage. We're back to the covering. When you join together and cleave to God and you delight him in and you set your love upon him, um, this is one of the becauses. Therefore, I will deliver him. And of course, it's speaking of Christ first, and then Christ is our example, and this is how we are to live also and set our love upon him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. And this could be speaking of uh, uh, Matthew 28, 20, uh, or 28, 18 through 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He set him on high, higher than any place. He's been lifted above, uh, uh, preeminence above everything. Um, uh, and it can also be uh, for us also. It's a, it's a difficult um, to understand sometimes. I will set him on high because, there it is again, he has known my name, my character, my nature, my will, my authority. And actually it applies honor in the Hebrew. And known, known as yada yada. Remember we talked about that? It's like Gnosko of the New Testament, but it's yada yada. So when somebody's talking to you and they go yada yada, they're saying they're, they're meaning you already know these facts, so I don't have to repeat them to you. That's all it is, and it's because you have we have known, we have known, we're coming to know, and we're learning to know his name, his character, his nature, his authority. That's what we're doing right now as we're learning. We're learning that it's not happening by accident. God is sovereign in the affairs of men. And he doesn't want certain things to happen, but he allows them. And then he uses all of them for good for those who love him and are the called according to his purposes. He will use them to change the character and our nature and our desires and our ways and, our, and, the, and the direction we're going sometimes. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. Once again, Jeremiah 33.3. Call upon me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. And, of course, we know that Jesus did call upon him, and he answered him. You have answered me, and he, and he raised him up, and his body did not see corruption in the grave. Um, 
that it means to cry, to call out and to cry unto, but not to address by name. It's pretty interesting. Uh, and, and to heed or to pay attention is what answer means. I will be with him in trouble. And this is the word for uh, tribulation, affliction, adversity, tightness. He will be with us. He's always with us. He swore he will never leave us nor forsake us. I underlined, or I circled uh, four different eyes and no, five different eyes. I will set him on high. He shall call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him. I will deliver him. With long life, I will satisfy him. Notice the five eyes. I, I, that's what God's going to do. Actually, in 14, he says, I will deliver him. So there's six of them. I like to circle them, and I left out a couple of them for some reason. Isn't that good when God says what he will do? If we choose to dwell in the secret place, then he's going to uh, cover us, um, and he will deliver us, set us on high. This is what he did for Jesus already. Uh, he answers us. He will be with us in trouble when affliction comes distress I will deliver him and honor him that's amazing boast in us promote or honor us actually the word deliver there is a great one guys and gals equip for the fight that I mean so see God doesn't just go here let me put you over here no, he equips you with the struggles you're going to to prepare you for the struggles tomorrow. And he equips you. He equips you for the fight that's coming. And, and, we, and that's why, that way we learn how to deal with the battle. That way we learn how to be Christ-like in the moment. That way we learn how to walk this out. And it's a lifetime. This is about life. The rest of eternity. It's going to last forever. And we're learning and being prepared in this womb down here where we're at in Christ to be birthed into eternal life in heaven with him. Uh, and it's so amazing. With long life, verse 16, with long life, I will satisfy him. Fill to satisfaction, have plenty, satiate, to be full. God is enough. And he's the only way you're going to find satisfaction. I was talking about this yesterday with... I don't even know why I was talking about a customer, but I like to share Jesus with people. So I, I had seen something where um, the Rolling Stones, the, the three surviving members, Mick Jagger, and what's his name? I don't even know their names now. But Keith Richards. Keith Richards. Mick and Keith are both 80 years old and running around on stage like they're 40. And uh, Charlie Waite was a drummer, wasn't he? So who's the other guy? Watts, that's what it was, yeah. So there's, there was four of them, but, and the other one's 77 years old, and they just put out a new album, and they're touring on it. And I'm like, this is insane. But my point is, is that Mick Jagger actually was being raised up as the next great orator. He was going to be a preacher in the Anglican church, and he was like 19, and he got hit in the face with a, with a soccer ball and bit the tip of his tongue. And so now when he talked, it had a little lisp to it, like an asp, like a serpent. You know, and, and so they said, oh, this is not good. You can't do this anymore. And so he drops out of the church and gets a night job, starts a rock and roll band, and writes a song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And that's the only reason he's going to go down in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but he's going to go to hell if he doesn't repent. And he's got a big serpent all the way down his body, and they have the song uh, Sympathy for the Devil and all that yeah, stuff, yeah. which is, they're, they're an evil bunch of people and still running around at 80, and God allows them. God gives them a choice. They can keep running, but you know what? They're only alive because God's allowed them to be alive. And they can still repent, you know? And I just think of those godly roots that were put in him, and then he turned, and uh, uh, but God says, if we will dwell uh, in the secret place of the Most High, look what he will do. Uh, he will give us long life, and I will satisfy him. Listen, satisfaction comes from the Lord. But long life, think about that for a minute. You might die when you're 30. You might die when you're 70. You might die when you're 110. But it's eternal life. It's the life. That, the life is about eternity, zoe. It's, it's not about these physical years that we have. These physical years, are, you know, he actually just said it in, 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 in 90. 
Psalm 90, he said there's 70, yea, 80. Look over, where's that at? Uh, no, ten. Yeah, the days of your lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years. That's what made me think of it, actually, when I was reading that, because this is the fifth, the, the fourth section of the book of Psalms, uh, and uh, there's a lot to do with that. If I teach through the book of Psalms, we'll talk about it, but I didn't want to go into it for the sake of this study. But actually, Psalms 90 is a psalm about death, and Psalms 91 is a psalm about life. Uh, psalms 92 is a psalm about the Sabbath or rest. Psalms 93 is about the Millennial Kingdom. They're all lined out. If you really want to look at it and study it, it's amazing. And, and really, this section, section 4, is covering like the book of Numbers. Section 5 covers the book of Deuteronomy. All five sections actually cover the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Which is amazing how God lays out systematically his work. And, and we go, well, man wrote that. No, no man would never be able to do something like this. Man had his pen in hand, but the Spirit of God wrote this book. And you need to understand it. And he will satisfy you with long life and show him my salvation. Amen. He will show you my, he's, he's going to show us his salvation. Now, that guess what that word is for salvation? Yeshua. It's Yeshua. Something saved, delivered, it's health, it's victory. Uh, it, it's not the word that's made for Yeshua, but in the Hebrew, it's Yeshua, which means salvation. And that's what Joshua means anyway. The Lord is salvation. And that's what Yeshua is. It's, it's so amazing. I'll show him my salvation. And, and that's what we want to see. But, but, it's, but it's not going to happen just because somebody walks up and says a prayer. Okay? It happens because you begin to abide and continue and remain and you draw near and you're asking him to be your father. You're asking him to be your husband. You're, you're letting him be your covering. And, it, and it's different with different lives. Some, some grow 30, 60, 100 fold. It's, it's different fruit. It's different ways. But it's always a love relationship because of the marriage and because we choose to hear the call. We choose to obey the call. We choose to surrender to him and confess our sin. And we're not going to be perfect at it, but he wants us to be perfected. Okay? And that's the whole point. And nobody's arrived yet. Nobody's going to arrive uh, until we see him face to face. And that's what we want to do. So just know that he loves you. He trusts you. He's here to save us. Does he hate sin? Yes. He hates sin pride and arrogance and the evil way but he loves us so much that he came and died to save anybody that will hear his call and repent so he's not against us he's for us right now but he's coming back soon as the judge for those who will not listen and, and just like he says only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked it's only with our eyes we don't have to experience that because Christ already took it all for us. He already took all of these things that we see. The, 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 the perilous pestilence, the terror by night, the arrow that flies by day, uh, the, the, the pestilence that walks in darkness, the destruction that lays waste in the new day. He took all of this for us already. And he allows it so that he can train us through it. But it's already going to have no effect on us except for godly character if we'll draw near and listen to him. But we have to keep trusting him. And yeah, it's, 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 it's painful. It's never joyous for the moment. It's painful. But nevertheless, it produces peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who are trained by it. And that's what we want to do as little children. We want to be trained and educated. We want to learn how to do better the next time, how to walk closer, how to stay in the secret place. That's what we want to learn to do because it's easy. It's, it's, it's so fun when you're there in that secret place and you're spending time with it, but you got to get up. And you can be in that secret place even while you're at work. We can be there, knowing that he's there, knowing that he's with us, knowing that he's allowing that next guy to come in and yell. He's allowing that next problem and that thing to break. He's allowing those things to go on, not causing them. He allows them, and he works it all out for good because he is good. He's good to those who love him, and he will show us his salvation. Next week's verse... Oh, next week we're not meeting, so this will be for, you're going to have this one for like two weeks. When's the next time that we meet? 
I'm going on vacation. I ain't been on vacation for a couple of years. Did I get confused? Yeah. Now next week's the sixth. Next week's verse is. <laughs> I was thinking I wasn't going to be here, wasn't I? It's uh, 1 Timothy 1.12. 1 Timothy 1.12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Listen. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Write that down. 1 Timothy 1.12. We're all called to be ministers. We're all called to be servants. We're all called to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation of souls. No matter what you've been through, and he's going to give his testimony there of what he's been through, uh, and God still used him in a mighty way to write three quarters of the New Testament. So don't think you've went so far that you can't be used, okay? He's waiting for us to surrender. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace and uh, thank you for your secret place, Lord. May we, we search it out and find it and spend time with you uh, and be still and know that you are God. Pour out your spirit upon us. Have your way with us. Minister to us and give us a desire to trust you in all of our ways as we walk out this life and run this race. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you.